The Tempest uh, is William Shakespeare's last play. Shakespeare's Tempest is a delicate thing. It is a combination of tragedy and romantic comedy. It's been called by many critics the finest of his great romances. It's been called an inherently theatrical work unfolding in a series of spectacles that involve exotic, superhuman, and often invisible characters. And it asks at its very core the most basic of questions. What does it mean to be human? Two other things to note about Shakespeare's Tempest. First, it was a huge flop, and second, it's not the play we're doing. <laughs> From 1613 to 1650, Shakespeare's Tempest achieves a remarkable Shakespearean milestone. It is the least performed Shakespeare play of the era. <laughs> Not to put too fine a point on it, people didn't like The Tempest. We can't really blame the bard for writing what audiences at the time thought was a lead balloon. He wrote The Tempest at the beginning of a really pretty hard time for playwrights. This period would extend throughout the middle of the century when the theaters were closed due to social and political upheaval, and because most people thought that theater was morally bankrupt. Damn Puritans. Puritans. Ah. Damn Puritans. <laughs> and there was this parliamentary order to shut all doors of all theaters in 1642. And I'm sure, as all of you will recall from your graduate degree in English history, <laughs> Oliver Cromwell led England during the 11 years between 1642 and 1653. That time period was called the Commonwealth. When Cromwell died, his son took over and was unable to keep the government stable. So the English Parliament invited Charles II back from exile to rule in 1660, the crown was restored. It was like the monarchy was restored. <laughs> like Charles had been restored to England, like it was a restoration. Huh? Ah. The English are clever. <laughs> but just because the theaters were closed, it doesn't mean that theater died. We are, after all, a very hearty bunch. Clever, hardworking, and often desperately hungry theater practitioners figured out ways around the laws. These were the private parties. These performances largely took the form of what we call musical entertainments, or an incredibly apt term, a droll. Drolls were short, adapted versions of well-known and familiar plays and stories done in a spirit of mockery and as a form of social and political commentary on the restrictions of the Commonwealth and the Puritans. Directors, writers, and actors would adapt these famous plays into funny, sassy, little tongue-in-cheek violations of the rules and titillate and excite audiences with their inappropriateness. In the very early days of the Restoration, mm -hmm. theater practitioners were able to break free from the restraints of the Commonwealth and theater began to develop and flourish. And naturally, theater practitioners started theater's return to greatness by taking the drolls that they'd been performing for 15 years and turning those short comedy retellings into full-length commentaries on the period. And all of the sexually suggestive dialogue and plots that you find in the early Restoration were all there because the rich and idle we're looking for a little debauchery after the Puritans. In 1660, when Charles reopened the theaters, one of the underground success stories of the Commonwealth, William Davenant, had his chance to become a Restoration superstar. <laughs> Davenant was only one of only two people to be given a royal writ to open a theater in London in 1660. His play, The Siege of Rhodes, was performed in 1656, and it is universally considered the first ever English opera. Davenant's production of The Siege of Rhodes helped to establish the modern convention of the proscenium. 
perspective-based scenery and allowing women on stage. Yuck. Yay! He was an alchemist. He combined theatrical and popular cultural elements together into this sort of heady and intoxicating mix of pure entertainment. Exoticism, eroticism, spectacle comedy, body humor, lampooning manners, allusions to Shakespeare, Johnson, Fletcher. All of these things made Davenant and his work hugely popular, even though it wasn't very good. <laughs> and the Encyclopedia Britannica in 1905 said this of William Davenant. His adventures have always given him a prominence in the history of literature, which his writings hardly justify. <laughs> his plays are utterly unreadable. His poems are usually stilted and unnatural, and his influence on English drama must be condemned as wholly deplorable. I like William <laughs> Davenant a lot. <laughs> he was known to work with another popular playwright of the period, John Dryden, who didn't have quite such a negative reputation. Dryden is another favorite guy of mine from this period, not only because he was a great writer, but also because he spent a lot of his time trying to persuade his fellow English playwrights and his audiences of their appropriate but somewhat misguided passion and obsession for Shakespeare. But he also wrote a play called All for Love, mm. based on Antony and Cleopatra. And it is arguably his masterpiece. It is a work that is almost never performed in modern times, but I would put it up against any of Shakespeare's plays in terms of its genius. It was between 1680 and 1682 that Dryden would do his most exceptional work and garner for himself the title of the greatest verse satirist that England would ever produce. In the earliest days of the Restoration, when audiences were eager for the good times to roll on stage, John Dryden and William Davenant were two of the very best at delivering what they wanted and at rewriting the earlier drolls and turning them into expressions of the Restoration spirit. It's not surprising that these two great writers collaborated occasionally throughout their careers. In the mid-1660s, John and Will joined forces and turned their attention to one of the last plays of the Elizabethan period, the play that some people remembered as being not very good, it was famous because it was the very first play printed in Shakespeare's folio, Shakespeare's The Tempest. The Dryden and Davenant version entitled The Tempest or the Enchanted Isle premiered on November 7th, 1667. But it was in Davenant's handling of Shakespeare's plays at his theater in Lincoln's Inn Fields where Davenant really earned his credibility. Davenant took an old London tennis court and turned it into an outdoor theater. This was a practice that would become a commonplace in London throughout the 1660s and 70s. Davenant loved Shakespeare to the point of idolatry and wanted his audience to share in that love, but knew that Shakespeare's plays would not be received by a Restoration audience with that kind of passion. So to convince them of Shakespeare's greatness, he recast Shakespeare's plays in the image and in the taste of his own times. Clever boy. Before Shakespeare's restored version of Macbeth was produced in 1774, Londoners saw more than 200 performances of Davenant's version. It was first acted in 1660. That means that Davenant's Macbeth was the Macbeth that people saw for 115 years, not Shakespeare's. The Tempest, or The Enchanted Isle, produced in 1667, was a partnership with Dryden, and this adaptation was performed in various guises for nearly 200 years. <laughs> this version of The Tempest was so popular so quickly that the king paid 
for an additional five performances of it for him to go and see in the first six months after it was produced. In his adaptation, in their adaptation, Dryden and Davenant knew their audience. They focused on clarity, elegance, theatricality, and filthy, disgusting humor. <laughs> Arthur Nethercott, an English critic, <laughs> wrote that he deplored Davenant's violating hand that rove murderously among the greatest lines in English literature. That hand resisted no temptation to rewrite, and there was no restraining. What was right about Shakespeare, this version wronged. <laughs> but what it wrought was unique unto itself. And that version literally eclipsed Shakespeare's original. It was a huge success. The Dryden and Davenant contains less than a third of Shakespeare's text and is clearly an attempt to increase the comedy inherent in Shakespeare's earlier and decidedly less funny play. <laughs> it was so successful, in fact, that Thomas Shadwell, gotta love the English, <laughs> wrote one of the very earliest English operas based on this text. And these two versions dominated the English stage until 1838. From 1700 to 1732, the Shadwell Opera was performed in 26 of the 32 seasons at Drury Lane. In 1746, they decided they'd try and put Shakespeare's original back on stage, but it was closed after six performances. <laughs> but from 1789 until 1802, a man by the, the name of John Philip Kemble arguably had the most impact on the Dryden and Davenant texts. Kemble was the resident director at Drury Lane, and he rewrote Shakespeare's play to include most of Dryden and Davenant's new characters, and then took the big greatest musical hits from the Shadwell opera and combined them in together, combined them together into what can only be described as a Broadway musical. <laughs> When Kemble took over Covent Garden in 1806, he revised the play again, removing most of the operatic elements, but keeping the Dryden and Davenant subplots. And this version remained in rep at Covent Garden until 1817, and it was the standard performance text of The Tempest until 1840. 1840. It was only after 1840 that Shakespeare's original began to return to the stage. It has been 400 years since Shakespeare wrote and produced his version of The Tempest, and for at least 173 years of that time, it was the Dryden and Davenant that was the most successful and most often performed. It would not be overstating my point to say, the play we are doing has a pedigree and a performance history as long, as rich, as varied, as important, and as historically relevant as Shakespeare's. Don't expect to play those great immortal characters penned by the bard. It ain't the play we're doing. We are doing a remarkable, funny, body, comedic lampooning of Shakespeare's original, a skewering of those sensibilities that are embedded in Shakespeare's Tempest. By doing this play, we are engaging in a process as rich, as varied, as important, and as historical as any doublet and hose, rigidly iambic pentameter-focused Shakespeare as the Bible production of the Tempest that you could see in any of a thousand theaters or parks this summer. We're doing something different. We're the only ones doing this Tempest. And we will be the first professional theater in American history to do so. <laughs>